Hello, bonjour, and thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is uh, Marie-Christine Lecomte, and I work for the Human Rights and Inclusion team on the development side of Global Affairs Canada. Uh, I also co-lead Gender Equality and Empowerment Workstream alongside my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Rachel Taverner from Side by Side and Sharina Shraf from Islamic Relief Worldwide. So on behalf of PARD's Gender Equality and Empowerment Workstream, I'd like to welcome you to our virtual session to discuss a just world post COVID-19 critical dialogues on religion, sustainable development and gender justice. As it's now become clear, the COVID-19 pandemic is placing at risk gains made towards gender equality in the past decades. Strong evidence suggests that the pandemic is deepening pre-existing inequalities, slowing, if not reversing, progress towards the sustainable development goals, and also highlighting vulnerabilities in health, socioeconomic, and political systems. So many of you know from tangible experiences on the ground that the pandemic is also negatively affecting human rights, including civil and political rights, as well as global peace and security efforts. Women and girls in all their diversity, especially, are experiencing intersecting injustices, including discrimination based on gender, race, age, ability, class, and other um, factors, identity factors. An appropriate response to the pandemic should be one that's human rights based and exclusive and inclusive of the most marginalized and vulnerable to help ensure that it responds appropriately to their specific challenges and needs. Civil society organizations, including faith-based organizations and faith actors in general, are at the forefront of efforts to respond to the pandemic. They have the knowledge and expertise to help further shape global efforts to better respond to the COVID-19 abroad in a way that protects and advances gender equality. So today's dialogue gives us an opportunity to pause, to reflect, uh, and also to try to answer a number of related questions. So for example, how can the COVID-19 pandemic be catalyst for strong action towards Agenda 2030? What action is required for achieving a world rooted in equality and justice for all? Where are the partnerships and pathways for achieving gender equality and empowerment by 2030? And why are faith actors a vital stakeholder in this roadmap? So I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to introduce our guest speakers today as well. We're quite thankful to be joined by such a panel of inspiring, experienced, uh, and knowledgeable speakers. So I'll give you um, uh, a bit of an overview of a bio for each one. First off, we'll hear from Dr. Nora kellop -Ellage. Uh, she's a gender and development consultant and a postdoctoral fellow at the Faith and Civil Society Unit at Goldsmith University. She holds a PhD from the University of London that explored the intersection of religion and gender within international development policy and practice. And she's also worked with a number of international development organizations, including the Joint Learning Initiative on Faith and Local Communities, as well as the gender offices of multiple United Nations agencies. Next off, we have Fafano Kumalo who's Director of Strategic Partnerships at Sanke and one of the organization's co-founders. Bafana has a long and accomplished track record in the NGO sector. He was Senior Gender Technical Advisor um, for Engender Health South Africa. And in that capacity, he's worked with the South African National AIDS Council, the National Department of Health, Provincial and District AIDS Councils, and the Department of Best Basic Education to integrate gender into HIV-related public strategies and activities. Pragya Adhikar, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, is the Monitoring, Evaluation, Accountability, and Learning and Communication Specialist working for Islamic Relief Nepal. Pragya has been working in the development and humanitarian sector for over eight years. Before joining Islamic Relief Nepal, she worked with Care International and Oxfam. As part of the Leave No One Behind agenda, Pragya has worked with a range of stakeholders and will be sharing her expertise um, in her spotlight talk today. Next, we have Dr. Mariana Leite, who is a global lead for gender and inequality at Christian Aid. She is an international human rights lawyer, activist, and specialist in gender and development. Dr. Mariana works on the development of holistic approaches to gender and intersecting inequalities that ensure equality of outcomes and rights for all. And last but not least, Mike Batcock, who is a policy advisor in the Inclusive Societies Department in the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, I believe it's called now. 
Mike has worked for more than 30 years in international development, from small business development to global LGBT rights and freedom of religion and belief. Mike leads on working with faith groups, uh, coordinate the development of the Department for International Development's Faith Partnership Principles, and he's also established the two significant UK Aid Connect programs on freedom of religion or belief. So before we launch into uh, our dialogue today, uh, I'll give the floor to my colleague Rachel, who will provide you with a little bit more information on PARD's Gender Equality and Empowerment Workstream. Thank you, Mary Christine, and a warm welcome to you all. For this event, my task is to give a short introduction to the work of the PAR Gender Equality and Empowerment Workstream. It is great to see so many members in our virtual room today and some new people and organisations represented. The Gender Equality and Empowerment Workstream was one of the first working groups to be created within PARD, recognising the power and potential of governments, intergovernmental organisations and civil society to further work together on advancing sustainable development goals. Five. It is a privilege for Side by Side to co-lead this work alongside Global Affairs Canada and Islamic Relief Worldwide, strategically working with our members representing different religions, governments, geographies and perspectives. We have many voices and lived experiences within our work stream, working in local, national, regional and global spaces with local faith actors as well as government officials. So far, our work has focused on two key areas with an underlying emphasis on building capacity in what we do. The first is to enable knowledge exchange, which focuses on bringing together policy and practice. We also work together as multi-stakeholders to identify and address gaps in the field of religion and gender equality. Last year, we collaborated with the Joint Learning Initiative and a number of members to publish a report on religion development and gender-based violence, looking at a strategic research agenda in this area. This year, we are delighted to work with Dr. Nora, who will present today on our new report, looking back in order to look forward the role of religious actors in gender equality since the Beijing Declaration. We also work together to enable joint advocacy in UN spaces. Last year, we worked with the Danish, Canadian and UK governments to host two side events at the UN Commission on the Status of Women. In this space, we aim to amplify and build capacity of local faith actors working for gender justice to influence policy spaces. We also had a number of events planned this year with Canada, Germany and Denmark, which were sadly postponed due to COVID-19. So looking ahead to this year and next, as a work stream, we aim to strengthen our collaboration between governments, intergovernmental organisations and civil society. Today is the start of a series of critical dialogues which will be hosted virtually to address the gender dimensions of COVID-19 and how we can shape a post-COVID-19 world. The UN Commission on the Status of Women remains a space which we seek to influence, with the value of working with governments to host high-level events. We also will be investing in strategic communications this year to amplify our critical dialogues and the work of our members. We plan for this to culminate in a joint publication with a call for papers being published later this year. Finally, we are already looking ahead to the next PARD annual forum, which we hope will be in person in South Africa next September, where we will host a collaborative workshop ahead of the assembly. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to the conversations that we will share and hope to collaborate with you in the future. I will now hand over to my colleague Shaheen Ashraf, who will moderate the session. Noura will address um, the report that was done on religion and the actors in gender equality since the Beijing uh, Declaration. Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce this new report on gender equality and religious actors. I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about why this report matters and what we can learn from it. Let me begin with why it matters. Over the past two decades, we have seen development organizations join arms with religious actors on a series of issues, including humanitarian assistance, access to finance and banking, education pro projects, and gender equality. But gender isn't just one of these issues. When it comes to religion and development, gender is the issue. And that's because religions are so deeply connected to gender norms. Whenever religions enter the public sphere, whenever religions become powerful in politics, they have a tendency to orbit around gender issues. Political religion focuses on same-sex marriage, sex education, reproductive health. Religious arguments are used to condone domestic violence, child marriage, marital rape, 
FGM. And why does political religion rally around gender issues? Because gender norms maintain the power structures of a community. Gender norms preserve traditional divisions of labor. Gender norms define the status quo. Political authorities around the globe have been breathing life into the idea that religion and patriarchy are inseparable. It gives them votes, it gives them power. It plays into deeply held gender norms. And this is something that is happening everywhere, including in high income countries. For example, in 2017, a US congressman vetoed a bill that could have banned child marriage in his home state. His reason? It would conflict with religious customs. Patriarchal gender norms are packaged in the language of religion because it legitimizes them. It makes them seem divinely ordained and unchangeable. It is time that development practitioners engage constructively with the intersection of gender and religion. Because if we don't, we risk perpetuating a dangerous and often deliberate confusion of patriarchy and religion. And this confusion not only maintains gender inequality, it sacralizes it. And worst of all, it steps in the back all those who fight hard every day to reinterpret religious texts and reform unjust laws. So what can we learn from this report? Three things. One, religions have inspired both patriarchal and emancipatory social changes. Over the past 25 years, some religious actors have hindered and some have strengthened the gender goals of the Beijing Platform for Action and later the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The report contains a series of examples of how religious actors have been involved in achieving those goals. Two, every development practitioner needs to have religious literacy. Religious literacy is the skill to understand religions in their contexts and to make sense of the seemingly contradictory ways in which religions and gender interact. Religious literacy acknowledges that religions are internally diverse, they're context specific, and they're subject to interpretations. Everyone needs religious literacy, whether you're a faith-based practitioner or a secular practitioner, no one just has it, everyone needs to learn it. It's different than devotional expressions from, of religion. Religious literacy is not being religion. Religious literacy is the academic study of how religions function in society. The third thing we can learn from this report is that we are all biased. I'm biased, you're biased, we're all biased. The 2015 World Development Report warns that mechanisms need to be in place to correct and check for these biases. Five years later, we are still missing these mechanisms today. If you're secular, you're not more objective. If you're religious, you're not automatically more subjective. Bias is everywhere. It's subtle. It's unconscious. It's saying things like moderate Muslims, which implies that there is something innately violent about Islam. Another example is when we call feminist movements around the world Western style or Western influenced. It assumes that feminism is an invention of the West and everybody else must have learned it from there. When we engage with gender and religion, we have to acknowledge our own biases and how they influence the way we select partners, the way we conduct research, the way we implement projects. Western development in particular has a history of forming political and strategic partnerships. In practice, this has meant prioritizing powerful voices, often male voices, those that have local authority, local legitimacy and the largest networks. 
But those big players don't automatically hold the most gender equal views. And this can have very, very dangerous effects. Here's an example. A few years ago, a Western government aid agency funded a gender project in Jordan. The project aimed to support survivors of sexual violence by setting up women's shelters. The project partnered with local stakeholders, including a large religious actor. Shortly after the inception of the project, the leadership was almost entirely transferred to this one religious player. Once in charge, this, this religious player introduced conditions on who was allowed to access the shelter. And paradoxically, these conditions now excluded women who were survivors of sexual violence because these women were now deemed unclean. Women's rights activists who were also involved with this project were furious and they immediately alerted the government aid agency. But the agency remained unresponsive. And this led to the women's rights activists disengaging from the project. Their voices were not heard and they were not going to endorse the mistreatment of women. This is not an isolated incident. This happens many times. It's, a, it's an example of how political partnerships take priority over gender goals. And the real shame here is that there are many women's rights activists, many of them religious ones. They were, they were available, they were excited about the project, they wanted to get engaged. Development has to listen to these voices no matter what it takes. I think we can conclude that the intersection of gender and religion is complicated. It's messy. But it's so central to the cause of gender equality. And development needs to prove its commitment to this cause now more than ever. There's no easy fix. There's no copy and paste option. Gender equality, like anyone in the world, takes generations to build. But if there's willingness and commitment and a bit of courage, development, unlike any other industry in the world, actually does have access to the tools, the people, and the expertise to make a real difference here. I really hope that this report is helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Noura, for sharing um, an insightful address, actually, for those of us who could hear it, on the role of religion, uh, religious actors in gender equality since the Beijing Declaration. And it's a timely piece of research um, that has allowed us to um, look at some of the evidences that have come out as to what the role of religious actors have have done, particularly around gender equality since the Beijing Declaration. And it's a really useful um, piece of work, uh, and we should be able to send that out to people if they're interested. I'd like to bring in next um, Dr. Um, Brother Bafana Komolo. COVID-19 has been a moment of uncertainty for all of us, and in particular around faith, feminism, race, and COVID-19. Um, so we have Pragya Adhikari from Islamic Relief Worldwide. She's from the Islamic Relief uh, Nepal office, uh, in which she is um, will be speaking on the Leave No One Behind agenda. Often, uh, Pragya, people are left further behind by a variety of forces, including globalization, technical development, gender disadvantage. In the work that you are doing, particularly around monitoring, evaluation, accountability, um, your work has led you to work with a range of stakeholders. Um, can you share some of your expertise around the Leave No One Behind agenda? Well, he hello everyone. Uh, this is Pragya from Islamic Relief Nepal. So thank you, Part, and in particular, the gender working group and the panelists. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I've already heard some of the int interesting responses. So well, um, to start with the Sustainable Development Goals, it was created in the spirit of leaving no one behind, which means like all goals need to be reached for everyone. Leaving no one behind, talking about this, it not only entails about reaching the poorest of the poor, but also it requires combating discrimination and the rising inequalities within and among the countries and uh, their root causes. 
So a major cause is that people are being left behind is the is due to the persistent form of discrimination, including gender-based discrimination. So several findings have demonstrated that the marginalized communities, when they are equipped with the proper awareness, knowledge, skill, and tools, they have the capacity uh, to monitor and hold decision makers accountable for the implementation of sustainable development goals at the local and national levels. Um, in Islamic Relief Nepal, in our projects, we have found that uh, when we are effectively connected with the local government authorities and the policy makers, so our communities were able to take the steps to influence the public planning and the reporting process so that um, it will support for the greater inclusion of the marginalized communities. Now, the question we need to ask is like who and why are people often left behind? So if we talk about Nepal, there could be an individuals, families, and the whole communities, they are often marginalized and excluded. And there are so many factors con uh, contributing to it. There is a caste-based discrimination. There is a lack of equal opportunities. There are social factors. There are cultural factors. There is a geographic remoteness. So, uh, and when why people are often left behind? So, when we think about that, then it, it comes the lack of a proper stakeholder analysis. So we, when we talk about why people are often left behind, then there is a lack of a proper um, stakeholder analysis. Of course, there is a lack of intersectional understanding of the community group. There is a lack of um, adequate data on age and gender diversity. There are need assessment that miss out the differential needs of the community. There is missing out on the barriers and enablers uh, for ensuring access of the vulnerable group. So these the, these factors are actually actually contributing for people to be often left behind. Now, uh, to reach the furthest behind the first, uh, we should be ensuring the active and meaningful participation of all the stakeholders. And in all the phases of policy, planning, and the programming, uh, the left behind groups of uh, participation, meaningful participation in all the steps has to be ensured. Uh, there should be a proper uh, database. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, focusing on the database, especially the disaggregated sex, age, uh, gender, and disability disaggregated data had to uh, has to, uh, to be in a place so, so as to identify who are the for this behind for this behind. Also, uh, we should be um, having a gender responsive budget allocation in our municipalities and our district allocation. We should have a gender responsive social protection provisions like a maternity leave, child care, etc. Now, I'd like to give an example from Nepal, um, where Islamic Relief is working on the LNOB agenda as a key component to our project to reduce human trafficking and worst form of uh, child labor in the marginalized community of Rautha district is one of the district in Nepal, and it is a home to some of the most marginalized uh, group in Nepal, such as Dalit, Janjatis, Kas, and the Muslim communities. So when you, when you look there, there, there are a lot of social inclusion. There is a discrimination against Dalit, Janjatis, and the Muslim communities, and these all are contributing to their lack of uh, the lack of socioeconomic and educational opportunities. Also, uh, there are uh, early forced marriages that is particularly common in the Muslim communities in the district. Uh, children, uh, particularly the girl children, they are often illiterate and they have less access to the formal, educa formal education. And this in turn has increased the exploitation, the risks to the exploitation and abuse. So uh, as a part of our project, we did uh, a survey with our partner and uh, we found that 80% of children in the district were identified as out of school and 30% of them were from the Muslim community. So, so having said this, there are so many complex sets of need and multiple barriers to overcome within this community. So we had to work and coordinate, coordinate with the multiple stakeholders to identify and, um, and adequately meet the needs of those they were those were left behind within the communities. For instance, like uh, as a part of the referral mechanism, we work with the faith leaders, we work with the local child protection uh, committees, we work with the district police, women's cell, youth and women groups to identify the children from the most marginalized communities and who were at the risk or been rescued from the human trafficking and child labor. So doing all these in the project, it it, it actually created a mutual tr mutual trust between its stakeholders, and it was also very important uh, for improving the community participation in our project. And uh, it overall, um, it was very effective um, for the overall project um, success.
So that's the, the, the that is a, one example from our project area. So now moving on to COVID-19 and LNOV, of course, disasters do not discriminate. Uh, COVID has affected all the sections of people, uh, but the most vulnerable, Dalit and minorities in case of Nepal, they are mostly affected. And among them also, the daily wage earners and the migrant workers have been mostly affected. And within them also, the, the migrant worker families and the daily uh, wage earner families having the elderly, having a pregnant and lactating, um, uh, lactating members, and also the person with disability are most affected due to the lockdown. And, of, uh, and this uh, COVID has given us a very good lesson that if, if we you are not safe, um, if your surrounding is not safe, then you are not safe. So the, it it has uh, it has um, raised the need to eradicate all types of inequality and discrimination uh, that persists that persists in our society. However, in this COVID context, we have seen an increased discrimination and prejudices against the poor and minorities. I'm again giving the example from Nepal. So during the initial phase of um, COVID infection, uh, the Muslim communities were stigmatized for spreading COVID. So, uh, so as a result of these, uh, that they were boycotted from the community. And even the people, they stopped uh, going to the shops of the Muslim shopkeepers. So this in turn had um, uh, impacted the Muslim communities in, in losing their livelihood and income opportunities. This is just an example um, what happened, but there are several such in incidences that happened after the COVID. And uh, uh, the, uh, according to the survey that was conducted by a uh, protection cluster of Nepal, um, there, uh, there are 32% per, uh, of the children, they have experienced a psychosocial problem as a result of a COVID. And 38% children, uh, the girl children have reported the increased workload at their home uh, because of this COVID lockdown. And uh, in the protection cluster meeting, even in the different media, we have, um, we have heard again and again about the increased incidences of sexual and gender-based violences uh, at home. So uh, having said all this, despite all these draw drawbacks, uh, of course, the COVID has, um, COVID, um, has reaffirmed uh, the integral role of local stakeholders in the humanitarian and development projects. Uh, local stakeholders, they are very much uh, vital in any of the projects. And often um, what we see is uh, we uh, see them involved in the implemented side, side of the project, but they are really consulted in the early planning uh, uh, processes. But but uh, while we identify the right stakeholder, it is also important that we should uh, recognize this contribution on the early uh, project cycle. That will just be that will uh, reinforce the mutual trust between the local and international stakeholder, and it also strengthen the partnership, which is a fundamental part of achieving uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, of course, the COVID-19 has presented us an opportunity to personalize the localization agenda and working along with the women and the youth groups. Uh, uh, and finally, there needs to be a greater accountability. Uh, so in our working municipalities, uh, municipality and citizens, they have uh, de together developed a future target to improve in each 36 areas of gender equality. Uh, that was measured through our community sc scorecard. And these targets, we are, that, uh, these targets form a benchmark and the, the citizens can now use to hold service providers to account. And of course, the commitment to leave no, be, no one behind should underpin all the aspects of SDG implementation. Our policies, tar, uh, targeting policies, our first financing policies, targeting, targeting areas should prioritize the poor and the marginalized group and leaving no one behind. And at last, but not the least, all our programs should consider safe and accessible complaint mechanisms. There should be uh, accessible information systems to consider the differentiated need of women, men, uh, boys of all ages, uh, abilities, and diversities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pragya. I think that was a really comprehensive presentation specifically um, around the Leave No One Behind agenda. And I think there's a, a variety of forces that you spoke about that actually feed into the narrative around this uncertainty during mm -hmm. COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So next we have um, uh, Dr. Marianne Nerlet. Uh, Marianne, it's interesting that uh, Pragi spoke about first financing policies. Um, there is widespread economic recession and protected financial crisis. Both have been documented as setting back gender equality and other development goals. So through the prism of gender equality, Marianne, how do we look to see a just world through economies, through trade and through these financial flows? Dr. Mariana. 
Thank you very much um, for, for the questions and, and, and thank you for, for moderating the panel. Um, I think uh, the example that Pragya gave was really good because it connects to some of the discussions that we're having at the global level about what a what a, an economic model that what how can we reform our current economic model to actually serve the people uh, that should benefit from it as well as how illicit financial flows affect uh, the delivery of the rights uh, that the communities we are working with are uh, really struggling to access so um so, for example, in linking to to the example of Islamic Relief Nepal, you know, when you're talking about uh, caste-based discrimination or um, um, child labor, you're also talking about the absence of the state or the government to uh, provide tools, resources, uh, and affirmative action to avoid discrimination in any sort of conduct that promotes a life that you know, uh, is against our faith values of justice, love, dignity, and equality. So uh, how can the, the government then fill that vacuum and therefore really tackle the, those issues and promote a context that where everyone thrives? Uh, the key answer to that is resources. Uh, we, unless we have resources, we won't have, for example, a strong social protection system. Uh, we won't have a strong health system, which we, we, we were all able to see, uh, unfortunately, was uh, quite um, key during the COVID-19 pandemic and still is since we're still tackling um, the pandemic. Um, so in order for us to actually be able to, to um, to have those resources, we need to have an enabling landscape, uh, an enabling system that is focuses on, that it's focused on human rights and has a strong gender lens with. And I would not even say just gender, but actually gender equality and social inclusion. So looking at how intersectionality connects to that and how we can really understand how the different levels of marginalization affects people, people's experiences and therefore experiences of deprivation. Uh, and, I, and this very much connects to the, the discussions we've been having since yesterday. Uh, um, you know, a lot of faith actors have been, you know, contributing to this discussion. Christian aid is not new to this discussion. We are rather trying to contribute to this wider movement for change and an ethical movement for change. It's very much driven by our mission and our vision and our values. So, for example, discussion in terms of what an economy of life looks like versus an economy of death. So for us, an economy of life is the one that's very much centered on human life. Therefore, it's against this uh, focus on purely profit. Uh, and for us, in order to have the tools to, to focus on human right, uh, uh, life, human life, we need to focus on, we, we, have, we need to have a human rights based approach. Therefore, we're, you're, we're arguing for a human rights centered economy. Uh, that has been uh, very um, uh, clear in, in some of the reports that Christian Aid has produced. Um, quite uh, recently, we produced a, uh, a report called Building Back with Justice, uh, Dismantling Inequalities After COVID-19, which basically looks at what do we need to do in order to recover from COVID, but recover in a way that really has that human-centered approach. Uh, we also have a report called Trapped in Illicit Finance that links this discussion about the wider economic system to um, illicit financial flows. Uh, uh, there are a lot of discussions at the global level about illicit finance. Um, when we have illicit financial flows, what we have, what, what happens is that we, we lack the resources that we are in dire need of uh, you know, to provide social inclusion and social justice, they are uh, diverted elsewhere. Um, so they are quite crucial, and some, in sometimes they are so they are so considerable, so so considerable that they are they amount to a budget that would be allocated at a national level to a whole health system. So it's it's quite a a a a, a, a big problem. Um, and one of the discussions that we're having is that 
uh, the, illicit, the issue of illicit financial flows is also an issue of decolonization. Um, the way we have today, uh, and the, uh, the, the definitions that we have today benefit the global north rather than benefit everyone in an equal term, so the global north and the global south. What happens is that the global north benefits and then the global south is harmed by it uh, because the definitions and the practice, it focuses on illegal practices in a very narrow term. So for example, looking at this definition of corruption, but not looking at harm in a more ethical way, which we would use, I would argue, as a, as a faith-based uh, group um, that looks at um, how this is financial flows would actually prevent the delivery of human rights, prevent uh, the, the delivery of social protection and so forth and so on. So what we're, we're pushing for in that particular report I mentioned is for a holistic human rights centered definition of illicit financial flows to make sure that that then feeds into this uh, new vision for our global economy, which is so fundamental uh, for the recovery uh, after COVID. What we've seen during COVID is that um, we are we're, we didn't have the right tools to respond. Uh, we didn't invest in the right sectors, uh, and therefore a lot of the countries uh, that uh, a lot of the countries um, globally struggled, and, and 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 therefore we've seen you know huge numbers of deaths and and, and, and other economic uh, and social uh, uh, effects of that pandemic. Um, so. What are the good examples and what are the bad examples? Just so I, you know, grounding this a little bit more. Uh, the negative example is that we have large um, uh, international organizations such as the World Bank, the IMF, uh, the OECD, and also um, um, we have the Swiss bank system. Uh, unfortunately, in terms of the UK, we have overseas territories that it still uh, use this very restricted definition that we think are is an enabling this environment that we should pursue in, in the post-COVID uh, scenario. Uh, but then we have positive examples, which makes us really hopeful and therefore uh, um, it gives us that energy to think that we could drive uh, more change and therefore deliver more on rights. So, for example, a lot of African countries such as Nigeria and, 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 and African bodies such as the UNECA are pushing for more uh, comprehensive approaches to that. In LAC countries, we also have examples and, and also the ECLAC, uh, the UN body in that region. And um, also in, in an example from the Global North, we have Norway who's also been very much leading this at the UN level. And this also fits to the discussion about the sustainable development goals, which I think is important for this discussion of, you know, we've been having since yesterday, is how, how this uh, definition and more, more holistic and human rights centered definition could uh, actually help us deliver the sustainable development goals um, by um, uh, releasing, uh, well, well, creating a, a, a better human rights framework, but also uh, leading to results that release resources that are fundamental for the financing for development process, which works, works in parallel to the SDGs. And again, as I said at the beginning, if we don't have resources, we don't have results. Uh, and that, that's particularly key. key. Um, so I guess uh, just wrapping up, you know, um, on that point is that uh, what we are trying to, to say, uh, uh, what is the very core of what we're trying to say is that we must decolonize uh, development and relationships. Uh, we must recognize our our role as safe actors. Uh, I believe Nora mentioned at the beginning it, it, this very interesting report and, and very um, self-critical report about, about our role. I mean, unfortunately, uh, faith factors haven't always been a for, uh, force for transformative change, but there has been very good examples and we have great champions as we have here on this call. Um, and we did track that as well in another report uh, that Christian did called Equality at All Levels. So, um, what we need to make sure is when we are looking at our um, um, 
the tools that we want to produce solutions. We want we need to have a, a holistic uh, approach to it. And, and then just on, one last minute to really wrap up uh, and going back to Pragya's example. One of the ba the biggest examples we have of a really uh, serious uh, issue that uh, that was related to this financial flows was a tax abuse case that happened in Nepal, uh, a telecom case. It diverted um, a lot of resources from the government. This is still being discussed. And as a result, we have such cases as was, uh, you know, quite very well uh, explained during the presentation. So I'll, I'll, I'll stay, I'll wrap up here and thank you very much for that. Thank you so much, Mariana. A really interesting um, area to kind of focus on, particularly when it comes to trade and financial flows. Um, this leads us on to uh, Mike. Um, Mike, I think the, the question leading on from what Mariana was talking about, she spoke about building back with justice. She made us think about some of the challenges um, that she's addressed to us by looking at the development of recognition to the politics of redistribution. Um, and how that works and how they are these kind of injustices that we must not um, uh, leave uh, leave behind, but we need to reflect and, uh, and address them. Mike, the current thinking about the nature and distinctiveness of FBOs in development under the new FCDO, how do we address and reflect on the specific issues through partnerships and with faith-based organisations? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Babcock. Um, yes, I will. I would like to talk about gender equality and empowerment, the new Foreign Commonwealth Development Office's commitment to that, gender equality in a time of COVID and the challenges that we're all facing, the role of religion, faith and faith groups on gender equality, and just as you asked, how the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office's is partnering with faith groups on these issues. Gender equality is at the heart of the new Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. When half the population is unable to achieve their potential, when they are prevented from being productive, or when their voices are simply not heard, there can be no sustainable path to development. Promoting gender equality is about shaping our shared future, about creating opportunities for girls and women to enjoy their rights, to contribute to their country's growth and economy, to shape their communities and country's future. Gender equality and empowered girls and women are fundamental to building prosperous, resilient economies and peaceful and stable societies. Our strategic vision on gender equality highlights that we believe in a world that we believe the world can be a place where all people are valued and have equal voice, rights and opportunities throughout their lives. In this world, girls and women will be free to stand alongside boys and men equal in their hopes and their ability to achieve their dreams and potential. This is even more important in this time of COVID. As Mary Christine highlighted, COVID-19 crisis is increasing pre-existing inequalities in political, social and economic spheres. COVID-19 is impacting, uh, is not impacting women and men in the same way. Global and national plans need to reflect this. As Marianne highlighted, we need to ensure that we build back more equally. We need to be investing in gender equality. Uh, and this is absolutely critical to achieving our climate and economic objectives and to building long-term resilience. Enabling women, people with disabilities and other excluded groups to play an equal role in society is essential to COVID-19 recovery. Women's voices and issues are not being heard consistently across the global response. Um, women and girls need to be supported as frontline actors and decision makers in driving the recovery from COVID-19. Faith, religion and faith leaders 
as Nora highlighted, gender and gender equality and religion is complex. However, faith groups and faith leaders can be important champions of gender equality and empowerment. They can be important champions on violence, on tackling violence against women uh, and girls, child and forced marriages, female genital mutilation, and promoting girls' education. We recognize the, that there is a need to challenge and change negative attitudes and discriminatory practices that hold women and girls back. This requires intensive work at the local level. Religious institutions and religious actors are well placed to help contribute to this. In most countries in Africa, Asia, and South America, more than 80% of the population are actively religious. Faith groups have a critical influence over the beliefs and behaviors of the followers of the religions. Religious leaders focus constantly and directly on moral issues and dilemmas. They have an important role to positively engage on gender equality. Research that uh, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office has undertaken has highlighted that uh, social norm change can be uh, um, actioned within 18 to 36 months, within the normal programmatic timeframes. So there are real opportunities to make significant changes. There is also improved knowledge of how to effectively shift social norms and measure such changes. It should be remembered that traditional interpretations of scriptures intertwined with traditional values can lead to discrimination and stigma. So there, you know, there, there, there are issues that need to be kept in mind. Empowerment. Faith groups can empower poor people so their voices are heard when decisions are made that affect their lives. Faith groups can subject governments to critical scrutiny and bring distinctive and valuable perspectives to policy formulation. Faith groups can reach those who might otherwise not be reached, hard to reach groups. They have an acknowledged position in societies and they are well positioned to empower people to stand up and fight for their rights. Um, what needs to be done? Partnership. We recognize the important role of faith groups, and we recognize in Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office the need to partner effectively with faith groups. I was involved when I was working in DFID in the production of the faith partnership principles. These guided our work on strengthening our relationship with faith groups, and they were based around building a better understanding, faith literacy, documenting the impact of faith groups, and creating safe spaces for discussion on the tricky, difficult issues. I've been trying to build on this by producing guidance for uh, staff across the world in uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. I've drawn heavily on the work of PARD, and PARD have been um, assisting me in producing this guidance. And this, this is, uh, the key guidance is around that we need to include faith leaders, male and female, at the decision-making tables on the issues and decisions affecting the lives of local, national, and global constituencies. We need to support the inclusion of faith leaders in program design and delivery. We need to support faith groups to integrate gender assessment into all of their work. We need to work with faith groups to build the capacity of local faith actors. We also need to work with faith groups to understand the context of behavioral change messages. 
faith groups are so well placed to understand those complex contextual issues. We need to harness the trust of faith groups within communities. We need to support faith leaders to tackle intolerance and hatred. We need to build up the understanding of religious and cultural context across the whole organization. This is, this is the faith literacy that Nora was talking about. And we need to strengthen the partnership between faith groups and those most excluded, those left behind. What, ha what does the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office do, is do on this? Well, I've just been undertaking a stock take on our work, and we are working with 130 different faith groups through more than 200 programs across the world. Our, through our country offices, we have programs which amount to more than 270 million pounds, and through the central funding mechanisms, we have programs which are worth more than 45 million pounds. Internationally, uh, FCDO participates in global faith, faith platforms and works with global networks. We, we worked, as, as um, Rachel has pointed out, with PARD. We've worked with the Joint Learning Initiative and Side by Side. We engage with faith organizations, well, such as PARD again, but also the Danish uh, Church Aid, Islamic Relief and Christian Aid on common agendas at, global, at the global level, such as the Commission for the Status of Women. With UN programs, we've been working on female genital mutilation and child marriages. And on these programs, we've been mobilizing local, religious, and traditional leaders to influence change at the community level. In Nigeria, DFID, supported programs working with faith leaders to change social norms and attitudes. And these have shown significant results in respect to intimate private partner violence and non-partner sexual violence. On non-partner sexual violence, we've reduced that the impact was a 75% reduction on the, the number of cases reported. In Sudan, we've harnessed the influence of faith leaders to work on ending female genital mutilation. Um, a review found a growing number of religious leaders in Sudan are now supporting and delivering positive messages on this. In Kenya, working with the Africa Women's Development and Communications Network, we're providing training for 30 religious and cultural leaders. This is contributing to a national policy process, which includes the National Action Plan for Ending Child Marriage in Kenya. In Malawi, we've been working with the Council of Churches to promote discourse on issues such as unsafe abortion and human rights. And we've garnered support of the termination of pregnancy bill and abortion law reform in Malawi. Um, and then finally, we've been working with, through UKA Connect with a consort, two consortium of organizations working on, to promote tolerance and freedom of religion and belief. So uh, gender equality and empowerment is at the heart of the new uh, foreign and Commonwealth, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. This is all the more important in this time of COVID. We recognize the important role that faith leaders can play in promoting gender equality and empowerment. And we are putting that into practice through guidance and direct program work across the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. It's really interesting um, with some of the um concepts that, and some of the, the creative ways that uh, FCDO and former DFID um, have spoke about some of the, um, the, the, the policy changes and the symbolism of working and readjusting with some of the uh, arrangements that have been done. And 
how they've supported faith based organizations in addressing some of the um, social exclusion and, and marginalization um, issues with minorities who, who are experiencing for themselves. For us, that's really, really important, actually, to be able to um, guide this into the next discussion and um, all the um, all the audience out there, if you're willing to um, ask a question, our speakers are available to answer questions. Um, one of the questions that I think that we would like to go with, and this goes back to Mike, is um, we recognise um, the important role faith leaders play in challenging negative social norms and practices whilst also amplifying community voices. They're not always adequately rec represented in policy making spaces. How do we in integrate faith leaders and faith based organisation into policy making platforms at all levels? And that's a question for Mike. Um, yes, that's that's an excellent question. Uh, we recognise the important role that faith groups and faith leaders can play in in all of these areas. Um, we have highlighted in the guidance that we've circulated around uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, the need to incorporate faith leaders in these discussions. Um, what more needs to be done? I mean, we, we've recognised the importance of this. We've tried to encourage people to do it. There, there's probably also, and it, it was also highlighted in, in the kind of guidance that I mentioned, there, there's also probably a, a need to build up the capacity for faith leaders to actually engage effectively in these meetings, to have, have the uh, capacity to engage in the meetings and also the, the information, evidence and data to push their arguments, to highlight the needs, to identify approaches that can be used to tackle the issues. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Um, I think to the panel in general, can I ask that question to Marianne, Dr. Marianne? Um, thank you, Shaheen. I, I think, yeah, I agree. This is a very important question. I. I I think, yes, it's about including, but also enabling resources, but also fostering, um, you know, the unusual um, collaborations. Um, so, for example, faith actors uh, collaborate a lot amongst ourselves, but however, you know, there isn't a lot of resources you know, or a lot of spaces to collaborate with feminist organizations, for example. Um, so fostering those very difficult discussions, which I personally think would push uh, the gender agenda a bit further is it's also equally important obviously uh, enabling and, and actively and systematically of thinking of faith factors you know to to, to participating in public uh, spaces the, the development of public policies and other relevant discussions and also really understanding when the you know uh, in we, which we know also well that uh, when we're talking about the secular um actors not everyone understands the nuances uh that that you know we have as as a group you know we are a very heterogeneous group and there are different spectrums and as you know nora was alluding to you, 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 there are faith factors that indeed are uh, promoting the backlashes against gender equality and women's rights so how can we also um use that to make sure we enhance the voices of those actors that are actually promoting human rights you know and making sure that those those voices that nor are normally that well resourced and are normally visible are used uh, as a force for change and also as a as a as a counter narrative and, 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 and as a counter uh, strategy to some of the very worrisome trends that we are seeing that have been actually enhanced during the COVID period. Thank you, Marianne. Um, really in a useful insight there. Um, I think one of the other questions that has come up is and this is another one for Mike. It is recognised that faith leaders can make sustainable difference to gender justice and equality when given the right tools and resources, including theological resources. Why is that funding? Why is it that funding is so hard to gain from these for these theological resources and perspectives that can contribute to sustainable development? Um, again, uh, uh, an interesting question. Um, 
hopefully there, 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 there is access to resources. I mean, we, as I pointed out, we're supporting 130 different faith groups uh, through more than 200 uh, programs of work. Um, it, there's always a challenge on access to resources, but we, we are trying to ensure that there is access to adequate resources for exciting and interesting programs. And uh, as we've said, there is a, a key role for faith groups and faith leaders in tackling some of these challenging issues. I think, um, I believe, Mandy, also that there are um areas in which uh, we used to have within the, the DFID before a, a group of a consortium that were regularly invited to conversations in around this. And Mike, will something like that be up again? Do you know? Or is it too early to say? Um, oh, yes, definitely. Um, Lord Ahmed held a faith roundtable in June and there will be more faith roundtables in the future. Um, yeah, no, there, there's definitely a commitment to engaging with faith groups through faith roundtables and also on, on specific issues, be it freedom of religion or belief or gender equality, where there have also been specific uh, discussions with a wide range of faith groups. Thank you, Mike. This is a question for Dr. Noura. Uh, Noura, what are the hidden areas on which we need to shine a light, on which are either being actively silenced or not attractive subjects to be addressed as we work for a just world post-COVID? And we can ask the same question to um, uh, also Pragya and Mariana. Could, hi, hi, Shaheen. Thank you for the question. Could you just specify um, which area specifically you're talking about? It's just talking about hidden areas on which we should try and shine a light. In the context of gender Gen and religion, yeah. um, what generally religion? No, okay. gender. And even perhaps religion, I think both of those could go together. Okay, great. Um, no, this is a good question. Um, so I, I think what's really important is to understand, first of all, that um, we shouldn't take for granted that development petitioners and um, Western development has figured out how to do a gender analysis and um, has figured out what what gender mainstreaming means and that uh, Western development is automatically somehow feminist and progressive because that's often um, a mistake that we make that um, we assume just because uh, that, that we assume that in higher income countries automatically there is some sort of more progressive thinking and that we will automatically uh, partner with progressive voices. So that's that's one thing that Western development itself has to review how the general analysis is done, because oftentimes it's a quick desk research and um, it's very superficial. And then intersectional inequalities are sort of sweeped under the rug and not looked at properly. Um, and um, also, well, that's that's one thing. And then doing a gender analysis before we select partners is really important that we understand sort of the, the, the landscape and that we understand what actors in the local, in the in the society that, that we're looking at are maybe already working on these issues. Because oftentimes um, organizations have partners that they partner with repeatedly and they have them on a retainer, so to say. Um, and these are selected before we actually understood the gender dynamics. So I think this is sort of my, my main point that gender is not fully understand by itself yet. So jumping to looking at how gender intersects with, with other issues such as religion and race is maybe a jump too fast. We have to take a step back and fully understand gender first. I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Dr. Nora. Can I come in uh, with uh, to Marianne on, on the same question? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I agree uh, about the point about intersectionality that we need to have a look at that and really understand what that means. But what I would add is that 
uh, we must look at the issue of power, really how to challenge power. So in enshrined in, in the theology, uh, the liberation theology, for example, and how to tackle oppression. Uh, and by in tackling oppression, I mean the, the root causes of inequality in, in, in not only gender inequality and linking the macro, meso and micro level. So how, for example, a macro level issues a fundamentally affect what we are living in the micro level, very localized. So, for example, gender based violence is not an issue in itself. It is it's, it's a it's a reflection of a unfavorable context where people are struggling and therefore need, think that they need to exert more control and power over others and therefore abuse that power. So it's understanding that as well. And obviously the issue we've mentioned today of illicit financial flows is just one very big example of how we can link the macro, as I mentioned, to uh, the meso and the micro. Thank you. And I think that's really interesting because, you know, there are the origins of controversy that spark some of the narratives in and around this, particularly around the, um, and I think it's something that you alluded to earlier on, Mariana, which is around the universal universality of human rights, but also putting that into the context of the cultural rel relativism that we have, that has been a long-standing issue on the international platform as well. Um, and I guess we can park that one and go on to the next question. And the next question would be for Pragya. Pragya, um, I know in IR Nepal, um, we uh, there was we we had faith leaders speaking particularly to um, human trafficking, uh, particularly where human trafficking of uh, young Nepalese to towards the Indian border. Um, you had a conversation with faith leaders, and most of the faith leaders were men. However, there were women who locally led some of the conversations. Can you come into uh, to this and speak a bit about this from the Nepal context? Yes, uh, like um, thank you, Sahin, for the question. Um, yes, we had um, uh, in uh, in the project that I had that uh, in my audio presentation, I had to give an example from the project uh, that um, Sahin is just talking about. Like uh, during the project cycle, we had uh, uh, we had a uh, uh, discussion. We had a discussion platform with the uh, interfaith leaders. Actually, it's a it's a uh, you know that Nepal is a country with a uh, with a lot of ethnic diversity and religious diversity, and the particular work working areas uh, where we are working there is a lot of uh, uh, religious diversity along with the ethnic diversity. So uh, what we did uh, in our project is that we had an interfaith discussion platform, and that interfaith discussion platform was a f it was the first uh, in the whole district that I are in initiated. Before that, that that sort of interfaith discussion never happened. Even the faith leaders were not included in any of the projects or any of this kind of uh, uh, programming planning kind of thing. But uh, I R Nepal started this for the first time, and it was very much successful. Uh, in building the interfaith cohesion, and it was uh, used. It uh, it was. Uh fruitful in ending the air uh, in preventing uh, worse uh, form of child labor and the trafficking like uh, for these like uh, our former panelists also said that we have to do a capacity building of those uh, of the interfaith uh, of the faith leaders so uh, in the project we, we did the same thing first we uh, we um, we just um, brief about the project. We brief about. We did a capacity building of the uh, FET leaders. Um, FET leaders in in child trafficking, uh, child trafficking cases. Uh, we worst form of child labor and so many different things related to that. Are related to the protection uh, and the gender equality and after that we know that our faith leaders they are very much uh, uh, very much well aware on this um, religious knowledge but but um, sometimes uh, sometimes um, uh, we need to uh, boost their knowledge with some uh, capacity building things so that they can uh, use those knowledge in um, in build in, in the po as a positive guiding force in the community so that's what exactly happened in our project so those four fed leaders they uh, after after having the capacity building events after participating in the project looking uh, having a um, uh, having um, um, a close uh, communication with the communities with the uh, local child protection communities they were more aware and then they started Started to end the social discriminatory and risk discriminatory action through their capacity building, uh, through uh, through their preaching, through their uh, through their fat literacy. So that was quite successful in our in our project. And I also want to emphasize emphasize like. Um, 
among the Fed leaders also, they were a pretty much um, young Fed leaders, they were the women Fed leaders, and they really can play a very important role in reaching risk communication to all those vulnerable groups and the reducing the social inequalities, stigma, um, like we are having right now in a COVID context. I think this is really very important and that what Islamic Republic of Nepal is right now doing is, is a very good example, uh, example uh, for now. So I'll stop here, Sahinia. Yeah. Thank you so much. The other one question that we have addressed that Bafana was going to address was around faith, feminism, race, and COVID-19. We've seen a lot of the stuff that's happened throughout the world uh, around race, faith, and feminism, um, particularly around race and feminism. And one of the important things is understanding how an integrated feminist approach is critical to both it both as, as a right thing to do and because it's fundamental to understanding um, and addressing the inequality and power imbalances that, that are caused and are caused by poverty and equality. Um, can I ask the question to Noura as well? Um, Noura, do you think that the feminist approach would create more opportunity for impact? Um, again, sorry, need to specify um, which feminist approach. Let's just say adopting a feminist approach to influencing, um, like, for example, Global Affairs Canada, in terms of its funding, um, has used applied specifically around a gender lens to its uh, uh, to it to, towards its economy in order to structure right. funding projects in and around that. Right. Um, thank you. Um, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, that is so vital. But again, here it becomes so important that we start um, uh, making a bigger effort to include voices from everywhere. And there's um, in in development theory, there's a lot right now being written about decolonizing development, and this has to be put into practice as well. That we start thinking about how knowledge has been produced over. Um, over the past few decades, and and, and who is who is producing this this knowledge? Looking again, um, as Mariana said, looking at the power dynamics um, of this. So when we talk about feminism as well, it's important that we that we include voices um, from the global south. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. In terms of decolonizing development, can I add that question to Mariana? How do you see speaking to, particularly around the trade and the economy side of things? How do we see? How do we? How did we look at the current economic recession, the protracted financial crisis in the prism of gender equality, but then also talking about this decolonization of um, the agendas that are already out there? And you spoke specifically around power imbalances that cause the poverty and inequality that we see. What do you think is the big kind of missing piece of the puzzle that kind of brings this together? Uh, it's a big question, I know, but. Uh... Thank you, uh, I'll give it a try. Uh, I think one of the things uh, in terms of decolonizing development, I'll go for the very easy point, which is just um, saying that collaboration is particularly key and having, you know, um, a, a, open, honest and critical discussions about these issues such as, as we are having here, you know, with different members of civil society and also government and also great that, you know, Mike alluded that in his intervention. So I, I feel positive. Uh, so just wanted to, to, to put that forward before, you know, mention mentioning that although I do feel positive, uh, I think there are, you know, a lot of challenges and the main one is in relation to the redistribution of power. When you're talking about redistribution of, redistribution of power, you, you are necessarily saying that some people will have less power as a result of that because they had more power uh, than they should have in the first place. So there will be backlashes. So I guess, you know, um, uh, working with those actors so they can understand that, you know, we, everyone will benefit from more equal uh, society. But also, if that's not possible, you know, making sure you develop strategies to, to handle the backlashes. And I think we are a bit lagging behind in terms of the handling of the backlashes when we're talking about gender equality and women's rights. Uh, I think that the, 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 the ultra right wing uh, faith factors are quite um, vocal and quite present in a lot of spaces and I feel that our voices are still 
a bit quiet in comparison, but it, uh, it might be in terms of resources of strategies. Um, I'm not, inter not entirely sure I can answer that right now. And I think in terms of the colonizing development, um, one of the key things is also understanding our role of faith factors and really, really fundamentally ch uh, 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 changing the narrative really changing the way we interact with each other and particularly looking at the global north and the global south and linking that back to colonization. Some of the things that we experience today are fundamentally linked to colonization. For example, when we're talking about LGBT plus, I mean, a lot of, in a lot of countries where uh, LGBT uh, uh, plus are criminalized or, you know, um, being put through a rich hunt, you, you can you can trace that back to colonization. So actually the, you know, the, the effects of that are so invisible that it's really even hard, hard for us to account for that today. So I think, yeah, you know, tracing that back, having those very honest conversations and fundamentally changing the narratives and how we operate. Uh, um, in, uh, I think we have a really big opportunity now with COVID. COVID raised a lot of the issues. I mean, in some of the spaces where people wouldn't even consider talking about, you know, changing the economic model and fundamentally changing things, as Mike was saying, uh, they are actually considering that now. Um, you know, for example, large multinational corporations in the U.S. issued a statement last year saying that they should move from a a shareholder model to a stakeholder model, therefore say, saying that they are actually moving ag against this idea that they should only be focusing on producing profit for shareholders, but actually f focusing on their sphere of influence, which I think is a really good step forward. So I think we need to make sure we map all those, you know, uh, positive uh, changes, uh, leverage on that and work together to, 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 to enhance our impact. Thank you, Mariana, and you answered the question really well, actually, to be honest. Um, can I take this opportunity to thank all the speakers? Um, can I take the opportunity to, to Bafana, who was unable to make us do, uh, make the conversation due to technical difficulties, for Pragya, who's joined us from uh, Nepal, um, for Noura, who's joined us as well, for uh, Mariana, um, Pragya, Mike, um, all of you. May I also thank people who uh, who are helping with the technical assistance, Rachel, as well as Marie Christine, who've been part of this. I think I want to end on something which is quite profound for me in the sense that um, I think it's important that we recognise that you know there is a rights-based uh, and informed gendered power analysis, and that actually in order to transform those gender power relations, that we need to tackle the norms and structures. And again, you know, that will facilitate and support individuals who and build a collective capacity for sustainable change, because it's not just about us, it's about all the areas that we work in. And fundamental to that, I think, is the approach is having really strong gender analysis in terms of the work that we do so we can have a fuller, more complete understanding of the issues that we're tackling, including the targets and the blockers. So may I take this opportunity to thank everyone for being on the call today. And if there are any questions or any um, further conversations, uh, we will be holding a series of events throughout this year and next year on some of the conversations that we've had today, and some of the wider conversations. So thank you so much.